I'm Manisha Dhaka and I teach animal law at the University of Victoria in Canada. In this documentary series, you'll discover the many ways that our Western legal systems fail to protect animals and also what you can do to make a difference. You'll hear the views and experiences of youth active in animal protection and of professionals who make animal advocacy their life work. In this episode, we hear about some of the issues facing companion animals, such as puppy mills, prevention of cruelty and discrimination, cosmetic alteration, and what happens to animals when families break up. We'll share some successful animal protection stories and ways that you can help and learn more. My passion for animal advocacy, I would say, started with dogs in shelters. Um, I've been visiting animal shelters for as long as I can remember, to the point where adopt, don't shop just feels like common knowledge to me. So it's honestly kind of surprises me when I hear that someone has like bought a puppy or something like that. Um, because I mean, the numbers vary, but there's still like one to three million dogs and cats in shelters that are euthanized each year. There's a couple of very important issues that have come to the surface during the pandemic. So one is dog breeding and the fact that so many backyard breeders are taking advantage of people opening their homes to animals and really engaging in appalling conditions. And this in turn is highlighting the fact that breeding of animals, like many other industries, is simply not regulated in Canada. So most places, dog breeders do not need a license to set, set up shop. There's no limit on the animals that they can breed. There's no limit on how many litters per year they can force out of a dog. And they're often kept in very troubling conditions. So I think regulating those conditions is another very palatable area for legal reform. I was a legislative attorney at HSUS, the Humane Society, um, and I worked on really advancing laws to protect um, dogs um, and puppies in what we call puppy mills. Um, some countries call them puppy farms, but they're basically large breeding operations that put um, profits over animal well-being and they just exist to churn out a large number of dogs um, that are then sold to consumers. When I started working uh, in the field, there were very few states that had um, laws protecting puppies and puppy mills. And now we can say that the majority of states do. On the life-saving side, we've seen a lot of laws that have removed barriers to making sure that animals that go into shelters come out on the other side alive. Um, and that healthy and adoptable animals um, can be adopted and you know have a, a positive outcome. And the pet industry um, has its like entire set of problems, um, which is if I ever were to get a pet, I would definitely adopt, not shop. They just pump out babies after babies and. Um, end up like mass euthanizing. There's a movement lately in the legislatures to ban sales at pet stores. So that's an area that I, I see as, as kind of a cutting edge move, um, which is really important due to the tremendous overpopulation. With increasing awareness about the reality of puppy mills, hundreds of North American cities have banned retail pet stores from selling puppies. These bans often contain clauses that permit the sale of rescue dogs from shelters. Companion animals are obviously facing um, a lot of issues as well. Uh, unfortunately, I feel like anytime animals are completely dependent on humans, unfortunately, uh, some harm ends up happening to them. And, and that's re really unfortunate. I think... It's, it's super important that we're helping animals in shelters and helping uh, companion animals out on the streets and helping companion animals who've been chained out in the cold or in the heat or just in general being chained outside. I think there definitely needs to be more legislation in place encouraging spaying and neutering these animals. You know, we see that dog and cat shelters 
like most animal rescues are completely overloaded. You know, they're having to to turn animals away um, or euthanize animals that they can't adopt out. And that shouldn't be the case. You know, we we need to be able to expand rescue work, um, give these organizations more funding, promote adoption and stop people from being allowed to breed these animals. So anti-cruelty law focuses on preventing um, animals from being subject to cruel and neglectful situations such as puppy mills, animal abuse, and, you know, domestic violence situations. And those animals absolutely need to be protected. On the life-saving side, um, lawyers focus primarily on removing barriers to healthy and adoptable cats and dogs um, for finding homes or for living safely in the community. The benefit of working on that side is oftentimes when you pass a law or you remove a barrier that leads directly to hundreds if not thousands of animals being saved. You know, there are numerous barriers to advancing um, the protection for, for animals. And I'll point to one that's sort of part and parcel of how we see animals in the law as, as property. If we imagine that some bad actor is hurting a dog and we see it, well, if the state doesn't want to act on the animal cruelty laws that are passed to protect those animals, either because they don't care, they're indifferent, or maybe because they just don't have the, um, the resources to be able to attend to those particular harms, well, then the owner of that dog would be able to bring um, a suit in civil court to be able to protect that dog as their property. And hopefully that lawsuit and any sort of uh, monetary damages would get that bad actor to stop. But the question really gets complicated when the bad actor is the owner of that dog. Well, if that happens, there's no real way for the rest of us to protect that animal. But we might also endow our dog as the actual victim in this scenario with the ability to have a case brought in their own name by us or anybody else. In the same way we could if this bad actor were harming a, a small child. And so that really gets to this question of, animals not being just merely property, but something closer to ourselves, you know, these legal persons who have these rights invested in them so that we don't have to sort of connect all of these dots, but we can actually bring these cases in the names of um, the victims, um, these, these animals. The numbers have been going down in previous years, but the vast majority of the dogs being euthanized are also pit bulls, which is where my passion for the breed specific legislation comes in. In seventh grade, actually, for a friend, I was fostering their pit bull and he was like the sweetest soul I had ever met. And when I found out that pit bulls were like this demonized breed, I just could not believe it because here was the sweetest soul I had ever met. So yeah, that was when I really started advocating for animals. Seventh grade in my English class, <laughs> I did a presentation about breed specific legislation and told Hayate's story. Hayate was the pit bull. Um, and I think it really touched a lot of people and it kind of inspired me to continue my path to advocacy. We also have breed specific legislation that basically punishes a person for having a specific breed of dog. And, you know, that could prevent somebody from getting affordable housing. It could, you know, prevent any, any number of different things. Uh, breed specific legislation. I've handled a fair amount of that. So discrimination based on breed and focusing on the scientific evidence or lack of evidence, I should say, as to the inherent dangerousness or viciousness of certain breeds or breed mixes. My view, of course, is to judge them by their behavior, no differently than people, instead of judging them by how they look on the outside. The other part is laws to ban devocalization or non-therapeutic declawing or other types of mutilations of animals. I would say that there's a lot of room for legislative progress on companion animals in terms of phasing out some of the worst practices of what is done to them right now. And so cat declawing, um, tail docking of dogs, and ear cropping of dogs. 
Those are practices that many veterinary associations are already prohibiting their members from performing because of the pain and suffering that they cause. And I think we need to start seeing legislative bans on those practices, both in municipalities, provinces, and at the federal level. I've written about um, companion animals and how they should be kind of dealt with in the context of family breakdown um, or separation and divorce. Um, in other words, kind of tackling the who gets the dog question. I think most people, especially people who live with companion animals would agree that their interests should be taken into account um, in determining where they go on family breakdown. So right now the law treats animals like property, uh, which means that the person who owned or signed the adoption papers of a particular animal is that uh, person's owner, um, regardless of the animal's relationship with anyone else in the family. So I argue that their interests may be better served by remaining with the person who cared for them the most, you know, the one with whom they may have had the more meaningful relationship. You know, it's easy to think about this in like gendered terms, right? So uh, in your typical traditional heteronormative family, uh, with a man and a woman, uh, let's say the man paid for the dog or the cat or whoever, and um, the woman spent more time caring for the animal, uh, fed the, the dog, trained the dog, walked the dog, took the dog to vet and grooming appointments. The law would say that the buyer owns the dog uh, regardless of uh, all of that and regardless of uh, that person's relationship with the animal. So I think that is a pressing issue for those animals. So the Pets Act was passed um, after natural disasters such as Hurricane Katrina, where you had many people who did not evacuate um, because they could not evacuate with their pets. And as a result, sadly, uh, many lost their lives. Um, and a lot of these folks were um, in vulnerable communities to begin with. Um, they were black and brown. There were many economic barriers that contributed to that situation in the first place. So the Pets Act was passed and, and basically what that did was it amended existing federal legislation um, related to disasters to require states and municipalities to consider the needs of, of people with pets in times of disaster. So before, during, and after the disaster. Um, and after that, many states had statutes that coordinated with that federal law. And as a result, there are opportunities now for people to go to um, shelters with their pets. And there are opportunities to more easily reunite with animals um, that are part of your household. Um, there's, there's no better outcome than being with the family that loves you. The really disheartening thing about the law is that it lags so far behind public sentiment, um, which generally finds that we, we shouldn't treat animals cruelly and that even if we are going to use them, then we owe them at the very least something along the lines of a life that's worth living. But with existing animal protection laws lagging so far behind still, you know, animal advocates have had to turn to alternative legal frameworks to advance their protections. Canadians are overwhelmingly compassionate across party lines. Animal welfare is a nonpartisan issue and pets are part of our families and, and we, we care about protecting wildlife and, and we care about protecting animals across our society and ensuring that they are not subject to cruelty. And so, you know, ultimately we need to level the playing field in Ottawa and make sure the voices of those who care about animals and the voices I think that represent the majority of Canadians are, are properly reflected in our parliament. Historically, there were and still are ways of relating to animals. You know, lots of peoples have particular terms for the winged people, for the water people, and, and so on. So every society had ways of relating to non-human life forms. And um, those ways of relating to the world were born of a particular time and circumstance, right? They were born uh, of, you know, different points in history over the last 20,000 years, at least, in, or in, in North America. So it, the work 
of rebuilding then is is looking at okay how what were the historic relations what were the circumstances the conditions which gave rise to that those kinds of relations and how do conditions today matter into uh, how we relate to non-human life forms because i think that we need to employ the legal reasoning um processes and legitimacies and legalities within our legal orders to ask the question for today about how we should be relating to to non-human life forms another thing um that i just thought of um is this favoritism among species like the the way um cultures will view dogs and cats as close friends but not extend that same compassion towards equivalently intelligent species or even more intelligent species that we may put on a plate or just view from across the glass or the cage in captivity like for entertainment it's just like our education system reduces our compassion for animals that is innate the world that we grow up in um reinforces the ideas that most animals are deserving or don't for some reason need the provisions that they do i think the way that we are socialized growing up and the way that we're educated about animals also is responsible and needs to change as well many cultures indeed even english speaking ones if you look back a few hundred years have such interesting ways of thinking about animals and living with them that if we can make space for those ideas in law we could transform these you know what i find quite limited and painful debates about whether or not an animal is or is not a legal person and if so whether a slightly smaller mammal would or would not be a legal person um so in terms of of what the the most pressing issues are for law i think there is a central one which is that it is not diverse enough in the way in which its ontology in and by ontology i mean the way in which it thinks about humans what it means to be human and non-human so so that that sort of fundamental outlook is is really limiting um our imagination and so that is what we need to deal with primarily I think that that is probably the the most fundamental barrier is the way in which we conceptualize ourselves as fundamentally distinct from other animals and that we have a very particular we meaning human beings have a very particular status before the law and that other animals have a much lesser status and I think one of the things that will be helpful in shifting that social and cultural attitude the idea that there is a hierarchy between uh where humans are at the top and animals are at the bottom that needs to be challenged and if that's challenged early on in in education um and in other ways if we just start on a different assumption i think it will be easier down the road to make some very important shifts in law and policy and other um areas of animal use I think globally there's even just language from from magistrates and and just judges across the world that 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 are incredibly powerful like last year the Delhi High Court judge JR Mudda ruled that community dogs in India have the right to food and citizens have the right to feed them and this was a bit of a controversial topic because there are many street dogs in India and people normally view them as a nuisance or they're loud or they they're they're dirty and and so when when citizens try to feed them it's 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 kind of like frowned upon but here you have a judge saying no actually they have a right to be fed they're part of our community and so there's a lot of incredible language of um of accepting animals as part of society that i think are incredible advances uh for animals <laughs>